What do the Golden State Killer, the Boy in the Box, the Grim Sleeper, and the Gilgo Beach Serial Killer have in common? All of them have been identified using new advanced DNA technology. The Grim Sleeper, Lonnie D. Franklin Jr., and the Gilgo Beach Serial Killer, Rex Hewerman, allegedly were both caught by DNA samples left on pizza slices. But can this new technology go back in time, half a century, and solve one of the most enigmatic crimes ever committed on U.S. soil? Or airspace, in this case? In today's video, we bring you a hot-off-the-press update on the D.B. Cooper mystery and how two men think that the case will be blown open soon by using new DNA technology, not on a pizza slice, but on a tie D.B. Cooper left in the plane during the infamous hijacking. Let us give you a rundown of the case surrounding D.B. Cooper and why it's such a mystery. On November 24, 1971, a man named Dan Cooper paid $18.52 in cash for a one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle on Northwest Orient Airlines, Flight 305. At the time, airlines did not demand evidence of identification, so it stands to reason that Dan Cooper was an alias. On board the Boeing plane, he drank bourbon and soda, smoked cigarettes, and calmly handed a letter to a flight attendant claiming to have a bomb. He showed the attendant a briefcase filled with wiring and red sticks that looked like dynamite. The hijacker's demands were $200,000 in $20 bills and four parachutes. Flight 305 circled Puget Sound for approximately two hours to give Seattle police and the FBI sufficient time to assemble Cooper's ransom money and parachutes and to mobilize emergency personnel. After arriving in Seattle, 36 passengers and two crew members disembarked the plane in return for the ransom money. The plane, with four remaining crew members, two pilots, a flight engineer and a flight attendant, took off for Mexico City. Cooper instructed that the plane travel below 10,000 feet and at a speed of less than 200 knots. While the crew was in the cockpit, Cooper dropped the plane's back steps and jumped out just after 8 p.m. The plane, now rid of its hijacker, headed on to Reno, Nevada. As word of the hijacking spread, a reporting error incorrectly named the hijacker as D.B. Cooper rather than Dan Cooper. This mistaken naming is how our mystery hijacker got the name D.B. Cooper. Following the flight, sketch artist pictures of the hijacker were released. The FBI identified Cooper as a white male, 6 foot 1 inch tall, 170 to 175 pounds, age mid-40s, olive complexion, brown eyes, black hair, conventional haircut, parted on left. FBI officials gathered evidence, including the hijacker's clip-on necktie and eight cigarette butts, although Cooper had not left his ransom letter behind. Agents also carried out ground searches and interviews. During the first five years of the inquiry, the Bureau had more than 800 suspects in their crosshairs. In 2016, the FBI stated that it was dropping its Cooper investigation to reorganize resources needed on other cases. The Bureau's current evidence has been preserved. However, Cooper's cigarette butts from the crime scene, which might have contained DNA markers, are missing. Not being able to test the cigarette butts due to lax FBI evidence protocol is a massive blow. But one man believes that D.B. Cooper's days of anonymity are now numbered due to DNA testing of the tie he left on the plane. Eric Euless has spent over 7,500 hours investigating the mystery in his continuous search for the identity of the elusive hijacker. Euless has questioned witnesses, analyzed DNA, and reviewed over 20,000 pages of FBI case files in his tireless efforts to prove what happened to the iconic D.B. Cooper and uncover his true identity. Euless now hopes to do this with the help of scientist Tom Kay. 
Kay analyzed D.B. Cooper's tie in 2009 and 2013 using a unique apparatus that collects particles in a filter. Kay's early experiments were designed to detect traces of metals, pesticides, and pollen in the tie. During the 2013 testing, Kay detected hundreds of particles, including high-grade stainless steel, aluminium, and titanium, among other rare elements. These particles are thought to be connected to the aerospace industry. Euless was particularly interested in one particle, titanium. Euless concluded that the titanium originated from a cold rolling process, which involves thinning a sheet of titanium or other metal between two rollers under very high pressure to increase the metal's strength. In contrast to the widespread practice of cold rolling that exists now, cold rolling was not prevalent at all in the 1970s. Euless thinks the particle places Cooper as an employee at Crucible Steel, a special metals company in Pittsburgh that was a key supplier to Boeing in the 1960s and 1970s. Euless said the business was a significant subcontractor throughout the 1960s since it supplied the lion's share of titanium and stainless steel for Boeing's aircraft. This is not exactly news. It has long been assumed that Cooper had links to the aerospace industry based on his use of aviation terminology during the crime and enough understanding of the Boeing 727 to access the rear stairway. In late 2022, Kay's discovery of further particles led Euless to a new suspect, Vince Peterson, one of just eight engineers working at Crucible in the years before the skyjacking. All eight engineers wore ties to work, and their assistants did not, narrowing down Euless's suspect pool at the facility. Peterson was identified as a suspect after Euless and his colleagues sifted through a spreadsheet containing over 100,000 particles in search of anything unusual. That's when tens of thousands of particles associated with the aircraft sector were identified. Another unusual particle identified on the tie was a trace of commercial salt. According to Euless's research, Peterson was highly educated and produced a research paper on the effects of salt on titanium. Euless claims that if D.B. Cooper worked at Crucible Steel, he would have had considerable knowledge of the aircraft he hijacked and the Seattle site, where Crucible Steel employees often flew for business. He also said that Boeing had a significant downturn in 1971 when the hijacking took place, and that it's reasonable to deduce that D.B. Cooper may well have been part of that downturn. Cooper also famously explained his reasoning for the skyjacking to one of the stewardesses aboard the flight. I don't have a grudge against your airline, miss. I just have a grudge. I can put him in Seattle. I can put him at Boeing, he remarked. He's a compelling person of interest. However, he also said he would not cross any of the suspects off the list until he properly confirmed his findings. He says he's going to continue to dig into Peterson's background. That digging might be unnecessary if Euless and Kay's new tests pay off. In early January 2024, the pair realized the filter device used to collect particles from the tie could also have held samples of D.B. Cooper DNA. Kay's filter, which has been hermetically sealed for the last 13 years, possesses Cooper's DNA with 100% certainty, the pair say. They now intend to share the filter with a cutting-edge lab for metagenomic DNA analysis, an advanced kind of DNA research that allows scientists to isolate individual strands of DNA. Once all of the DNA strands from the tie have been isolated, Kay and Euless will start creating a genetic profile of Cooper to compare to suspects, such as Peterson. The DNA will also be used for forensic genealogy, enabling the team to create a family tree for Cooper and then work backward to identify him. People thought I was kidding when I said things are moving so fast that we could solve this by the end of the year, but I wasn't, 
Euless joked, emphasizing the importance of DNA development. Metagenomic DNA is the holy grail where this is concerned, because it can separate individually all of the DNA profiles on the tie, even for something like a dog. So if D.B. Cooper had a dog, we'd be able to find that on there. It's critically important because, let's say you have a dozen different DNA profiles on that tie from everyone who has come into contact with it over the years, including various FBI agents and Cooper himself. We will be able to separate all of those strands individually, and while we won't know which one is Cooper's, we will be able to gradually narrow them down. If D.B. Cooper had any kids, for example, those children would likely be on the tie as well. So if any of the dozen or so profiles on the tie are related, that will most likely be Cooper's. The tie has been tested for DNA twice, with little results, but Euless emphasized that the testing methods employed by investigators 20 years ago are like the Stone Age compared to metagenomic DNA technology available today. Euless went as far as suing the FBI for access to Cooper's tie for more testing in 2023, but a court dismissed the case. Despite saying that they no longer want the FBI's help in solving the case, he continues to advocate for access to Cooper's tie. Euless wants to analyze a hidden spindle in the tie's knot, which he claims investigators missed and might hold an isolated amount of Cooper's DNA. Metagenomic DNA testing is expensive, time-consuming, and complicated, he said. That's why the spindle is of great importance, because it's protected. We're likely dealing with a situation where D.B. Cooper's DNA is isolated on that spindle. Maybe there's one or two profiles there, compared with the rest of the tie, which could contain dozens. Testing the spindle could give us a solid, clean, and simple profile. In a stroke of luck and some brilliant amateur detective work, Euless and Kay may not have to fight the FBI in court for access to retest the tie or its spindle. When Vince Peterson's name came up as a possible suspect, Euless took the bull by the horns and contacted the now deceased man's family. While convinced their father is not Cooper, the family has given Euless an envelope from Peterson. Fortunately, his daughter has handed me an envelope containing a letter he sent to his mother in 1961. The stamp is still in place, and the envelope is in fact still sealed at the back and torn down the edge to get the letter out. This was before the days of self-sticking stamps and envelopes, so his DNA is on there and affords me the opportunity to sequence Vince Peterson's DNA and do a direct comparison to what we come up with from the tie. The thing that's beautiful about that is, we know one way or the other. According to Euless, the envelope is overflowing with Peterson's DNA, which, when paired with a current DNA metagenomics, might lead to Peterson being recognized as Cooper by the end of the year. It may, of course, not be Peterson, but the envelope's DNA allows Euless to rule him out and continue with the inquiry. What's wonderful about it is that we know one way or the other. How does the Peterson family feel about their patriarch being branded as one of the most infamous criminals in U.S. history? In his final attempt to persuade the FBI to grant him access to the tie, Euless enlisted the help of Vince Peterson's daughter, Julie Dunbar, to appeal directly to the FBI. Dunbar said she had never heard of D.B. Cooper growing up and became aware of the case four years ago when a documentary about the unsolved hijacking aired on the TV channel she was watching. She hadn't given the case much thought until her son sent her a news article from a local Pittsburgh station naming her father as an unofficial suspect in the case. Dunbar said that she was initially shocked upset and slightly angry at Ulysses' insinuations. She emailed him, and the two agreed to speak over the phone. While Ulysses did not persuade her that her father was the skyjacker, she found his investigation interesting and believes her father may have known the actual perpetrator, even though he was almost certainly unaware 
they had carried out the heist. Anything is possible, said Dunbar, who would have been seven years old when Cooper committed the skyjacking. I spoke to Eric about this clip on Ty. As far as I know, my dad didn't have one in his wardrobe. Maybe it was something that he kept at work, and someone else could have borrowed it and not returned it. However, she hopes that the FBI will allow Euless access to the tie so that she can finally clear her father's name. Dunbar said, I told Eric I understand all the evidence he's gathered and that he's claiming the research leads to where my dad worked and everything and that's fine, but it's my dad's character you really need to rely on because this is not something he would have done. He wouldn't have dived out of a plane. He wouldn't have abandoned the family the day before Thanksgiving and flown out to Washington, decided to hijack a plane and asked for four parachutes and 200k and then jumped out of the plane in the dark of night when it was raining. That's just not my dad. He was a very well-educated man. He didn't do anything on the spur of the moment and something like this is just so far out of his character. Dunbar continued, Eric's story is very compelling, I'll give him that, but it does not change my point of view that my dad was not D.B. Cooper. Dunbar said her father had no prior experience flying or jumping out of a plane. She said he did serve in the Merchant Marines, but had no other military experience. He was just a normal, everyday father, said Dunbar. He enjoyed being with his family, going on trips with us, going fishing or playing golf. He was exactly what you would want him to be as a dad. Dunbar imagined how her father would react to allegations that he was D.B. Cooper and said he would be stunned. She went on, he would be totally shocked, he'd be flabbergasted to say the very least. He would say, well that's stupid. He'd call D.B. Cooper stupid and ask what that person was thinking. Aside from the tie, the only other trace of Cooper popped up in 1980 when a young boy digging along the banks of the Columbia River in Tenabar discovered $5,800 in $20 bills buried in the ground. The bill's serial numbers matched those issued to Cooper during the skyjacking, but the discovery yielded no new leads. Euless still hopes to solve the case by the end of the year using new technology and the DNA sample provided by the Peterson family. By December 31st, 2024, this is going to be a new world as far as this case is concerned, he said. Do you think Euless and Kay are onto an explosive unmasking of the infamous D.B. Cooper? Leave us a comment below. We would love to hear from you. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.